so I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping about um, how this webinar is going to go. So I believe um, all of you probably have noticed your cameras and um, audio are all disabled. Um, so please don't try to turn them on. <laughs> you won't be able to. Um, so the way the format is going to work, um, Cora will give the presentation and then following the presentation, there will be a time for Q&A. So at any time uh, during the webinar, if you have a question, feel free to drop those in the chat and we will address those afterwards. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce Cora Burcham, who is Save the Manatees Director of Multimedia and Manatee Research Associate. Um, she spends a lot of time at Blue Spring. She's an expert uh, on the park and the research there. So I'm going to turn it uh, oh, on to Cora. Awesome. Well, thanks, Megan, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm excited to uh, to give this webinar. It is also being recorded, like Megan said, so it's going to be available on our website afterwards. So um, I've been working with Save the Manti Club for almost nine years now, and I'm really honored to um, work at Blue Spring State Park with our main researcher, Wayne Hartley. So today's presentation is particularly about our research at Blue Spring. As many of you may know, it is actually Manti Awareness Month, and today, um, uh, November 15th is the official start date of Manatee season, so uh, very timely and we are hoping that it's going to get a little bit cooler at the end of the week and that we can actually officially start our Manatee research and our Manatee season at Blue Spring. It's been unseasonably warm, um, as those of you who are in Florida know, um, so we have not had very many Manatees come to Blue Spring just yet but that is about to change. So perfect timing for presentation to give an overview of the work we're doing um, and give you a little bit of a background as to um, what's coming this winter. So let me share my screen. Go. Oops. All right. So um, to start with a brief overview uh, for those of you who may not be um, familiar with Blue Spring, Blue Spring is located in Orange City, Florida, so it's between Orlando and Daytona Beach, so Central Florida area, as you can see here on the map on the right hand side. It is a first magnitude spring and it's the biggest spring along the St. Johns River, so there's a lot of different springs, but Blue Spring is the biggest one. And what makes Blue Spring so special is that it's a protected warm water sanctuary for manatees in the winter months between November and March. So that's really important to keep in mind. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So why do manatees come to Blue Spring? Here on the right hand side, you can see a picture from last season. Lots and lots of manatees. It was a really cold day. They come to Blue Spring because they cannot tolerate water temperatures below 68 degrees Fahrenheit or um, about 20 degrees Celsius for prolonged periods of time. So although manatees look very uh, fat and blubbery, they only have about an inch of fat layer and that's not a lot, um, which means that they're unlike seals, seals, uh, walruses or those kind of animals that don't really have that blubber layer to keep them insulated. So when the water temperatures drop, they have to find a warm water site. So Blue Spring is one of the primary warm water sites uh, or natural warm water sites for manatees in the state of Florida. So the spring is always 72 degrees year round, um, about 22.5 Celsius. So in the winter time, it feels really warm. And in the summertime, if you were to swim there, it would feel really cold and refreshing. So the spring itself has no food for manatees, so they are going out into the adjacent St. John's River to feed. So they do come into the spring to stay warm, to uh, conserve energy, to rest, to uh, socialize, nurse their young, but then they go out into the St. John's River to feed and then they come back into the spring. So what do we actually do when I say um, we're doing manatee research at Blue Spring? So here you can see me and Wayne Hartley, who is our main researcher, and we are in our research canoe doing our so-called roll call 
um, which we do every day in the winter time where we count and identify the manatees. And the primary goal of this is the photo ID and genealogy research. So we actually track genealogies, um, generations of manatees, and some of them go back all the way into the 1970s. So when Jacques Cousteau first came to Florida, he came to Blue Spring, and two of the manatees that he saw back in the early 70s are actually still at Blue Spring. So we have been able to keep track of these manatees over all of these years. So every morning we go out and we count and identify the manatees. Most manatees have scars on them, primarily from collisions with boats and also from some other minor things. And that's how we keep track of the individuals. That's how we tell them apart. They are identified by their scars. And we do have scar sheets and photographs. So I'm going to show you the scar sheets in the next slide. We try to take a photo of every manatee every season, but we can't really be out on the canoe with a big photo album with a photo of every single individual. So what we do is we have these scar sheets where we draw the manatees and that's what we keep with us on the canoe. And then at the end of the season, all that data is submitted to the statewide manatee individual photo identification database in short MIPS. And the work that we're doing at Blue Spring, a lot of other researchers, organizations, agencies are doing very similar work in other parts of Florida. So at the end, all of that data is combined into one big statewide database. We also record the number of boat strikes that manatees suffer um, over the course of one winter season, which is something that's very unique um, to Blue Spring. That kind of research is not done anywhere else. We also record the number of calves and the number who quote unquote stay the season, which means we see the manatee before January 1st and we have to see it again after January 1st for it to um, go into the stay the season category. And then we also help with the identification of deceased manatees in the St. John's River region. So this is what one of our scar sheets looks like. This is Wayne on the canoe with his notebook and his scar sheets. So as you can see, there's silhouettes of every manatee and we have to redraw them pretty much every season because sometimes old scars heal and change. They may get covered by new scars, all those kind of things. So this is constantly a work in progress and constantly updating. So I put this together just to kind of give you an idea of a manatee genealogy. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, and it's a little bit simplified here for the presentation. But as you can see, we basically track the females. Um, the males are not part of the genealogy because they don't have the calves. And we're going from one female here, Dawn. She was at the head of, um, at the beginning of that matriarchy, and then it's going all the way down to her calves, her grand calves, and then her great grand calves, and so on and so forth. And all the manatees that are here in um, in the black font, those are the ones that are actually still alive. So we do keep track of them over generations, and it's not always easy, but we try to do our best to uh, to do that. And the longest generation right now um, has it's a seven generation. Um, of manatee, so going back seven generations, which is quite long. So who is who at Blue Spring? There are three different categories of manatees. So the first one would be known Blue Spring manatees that have a Blue Spring or in short a BS number in a name. So one example would be Lily. Um, she is a well-known Blue Spring manatee. As you can see, she's very well marked, um, very easy to identify. So she is a known and named Blue Spring Manatee that we recognize every season when she comes back. Then the second category are manatees that are really well marked, but we've never seen them at Blue Spring before. So they get a temporary um, unknown number or a U number. And then at the end of the season, if we can definitely not match them to anyone we know at Blue Spring, they then get a Blue Spring name and a number. So for example, this one here, um, came in last season, um, as you can see, very identifiable marks, but we had never seen it at Blue Spring before. So it was numbered U9421 for the 2021 Manatee season. And at the end of the season, it would get a name and a number. And then the third category would be those Manatees that have very um, slight marks, for example, um, very small scratches or things that are very temporary 
or brand new boat strikes that we really have no idea how they're going to hear. So they get a seasonal number. So that means we can keep track of them throughout the course of a season, but we may not be able to recognize them if they come back the following season. So this would be one of the, one, the ones. It's a um, small juvenile that just has some uh, minor superficial scratches there on the tail um, that we kept track of during the season last year, but we don't really know if we're going to be able to recognize it um, if it comes back um, right now with season starting. So matching manatees is not always as easy as it sounds. Um, oftentimes the scars can heal and change. New scars may cover older scars and some scars just heal very differently than expected. So just some examples here. This is Moira Rose. Um, she was a manatee that was rescued two seasons ago for cold stress. And she came back last season, and as you can see, all these scars um, have just turned into these woolly really gray scars that are extremely difficult to see if you're not up close, so it's very difficult to re-identify her. Another example here is a manatee from two years ago um, where you can see it had a pretty fresh boat strike there on its back, and it healed very differently than we expected. So we were able, able to recognize it last year, but we really had to look very closely and compare pictures and put them side by side to make sure that's actually the same individual. And then we have those that do get um, hit by boats and they heal pretty much exactly like you would expect them to heal. Very easy to recognize, so then they get a name and a number pretty much immediately when we re-recognize them. So um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with our adoption program, so I'm just going to give a really quick overview and summary about that because it really ties in with our research at Blue Spring. So there are currently 23 Blue Spring manatees in the program. And we do provide regular updates on them. So if you adopt a manatee, then we will provide updates um, in our newsletter, on our social media pages, on our website, all those kind of things. So you can learn more about the program on our website. I put the URL in here for those of you that are interested. And oftentimes we get asked, um, what does it take to become an adoptee? Like, how do we choose which manatee is going to be part of the program? So first of all, it needs to have some sort of identifying marks that allows us to recognize the individual. So like you've seen on the previous slides, um, you know, if they just have some minor scratches and we have no idea if we're going to be able to keep track of them, we don't really want to include them in the program because if you adopt a manatee from us, you want updates. Like you want to know if we actually saw Annie or Gator or Howie, and we're not just going to make that up, but we want to make sure that we actually recognize these individuals. So they have to have some sort of permanent marks that make them very identifiable. We also want them to have a little bit of a history of coming back to Blue Spring. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we do not include calves in the adoption program, because we really don't know if they're going to come back and we're, if we're going to be able to identify them. So we want to have some entities where we can be pretty sure that they're actually going to return. And then last but not least, they need to have some sort of interesting history because we do write a biography for those adoptees. So we want to you know, let you know a little bit about your manatee. So how are the Blue Spring manatees doing right now? I mean, manatees have been pretty much all over the news, especially over the last two years with the ongoing, ongoing um, unusual mortality event along the Atlantic coast of Florida, primarily in the Indian River Lagoon um, in Brevard County. Um, so oftentimes we get asked, well, what about the Blue Spring manatees? So the 2021-22 season, the last winter season, saw record numbers at Blue Spring. Overall, the manatees looked really healthy, meaning they looked really um, plump, uh, you know, well nourished, like the manatee here. That's actually adoptee Annie. Um, in the picture with her little calf, they, they overall had really good body condition. Also, there is a moratorium in effect between October and March, so the area around Blue Spring. Um, no vegetation removal and no herbicide spraying is allowed. So all the food, including all the invasive plants, are left in place for manatees to feed on. So there is sufficient food sources for them in the vicinity of the state park. Um, so like I said, sufficient floating vegetation is in the vicinity. What we are concerned about, though, is the loss of submerged aquatic vegetation, um, the Valisneria or eelgrass, which has really disappeared from the St. John's River as well. So that's a big concern and we're keeping an eye on that. 
Um, luckily, there is a lot of sufficient um, floating vegetation available for manatees. So as of right now, the blue spring manatee population is increasing and is doing really well. So to show you this in a little bit of a, um, a graph format here, you can really see how from when Wayne first started the research in the early 1970s, he started with 36 manatees, and now we're seeing over 800 individuals in a single season. So you can really see how that has exponentially gone up, and same thing with the calves, so although this doesn't look as um, impressive on this graph here, but you can see how the, calf, the number of calves has really gone up as well. So during the last season, we saw a record number of 842 manatees throughout the season. 83 of those were calves, which was also record. And we saw 721 manatees in one single day. So if you were at Blue Spring or you were watching our webcams, there was just a carpet of uh, manatees. So lots of manatees coming in in one day. So why have those numbers increased so much in that area? Well, there's several reasons that we believe have contributed to that. First of all, like I said, Blue Spring is a protected manatee sanctuary during the winter months. So that means manatees can really come in there to just be manatees. Um, and there's no boating, no swimming, no paddling allowed during the winter months. People can see the manatees from the boardwalk that goes along the spring run. And it's crystal clear water, so it's it's a it's a really good view. You can really see them, but they can just go about their business and you know nurse their young, like in this picture here, um, rest undisturbed and do whatever they they please without being disturbed. Like I said before, there are good food sources in the area. Um, we see a very good reproduction and survival rate, meaning a lot of the calves, um, you know, they they survive past the first year when they're weaned. Um, and we're also seeing that the calves in this area seem to be growing bigger and quicker than in other areas, which then contributes to them being weaned earlier, and then the mother can start reproducing again. So instead of reproducing every two to five years at Blue Spring, we pretty much see a reproduction rate of every two years, which then again contributes to them having more offspring um, and having them quicker. And we also see, and it's very encouraging, some migrants from other places that are coming to Blue Spring. So I've compiled a few here on this slide, uh, just a few examples. So we do have some manatees that just come from other springs in the St. John's River that come to Blue Spring, like here on the bottom uh, left hand corner. This is an individual that was known from Silver Glen Spring. And really encouraging, we do see some other manatees coming from the East Coast, from Brevard County, which is that's the area where the unusual mortality event is going on right now. And we are seeing manatees from those areas coming to Blue Spring. So that's really encouraging. We're hoping that more manatees will find their way into the St. John's River and relying on these natural springs rather than the power plants. But um, so those are some examples of those animals that have found their way to Blue Spring. Um, before I continue talking about our involvement and some of the other things other than the photo ID, I just wanted to um, throw this slide in there because um, we are not the only agency doing manatee work. And when I talk about, especially when I talk about rescue, rehab and release and post-release monitoring of manatees, I want everyone to understand that this is a really big um, collaboration between lots and lots of different agencies. and. Um, we are all part of the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership, in short MRP. And here on the slide is all the various partners that are part of that partnership. Um, for those of you interested in learning more, there's actually a webinar this Friday on the 18th at 3 p.m. I put the link down here, manatee-rescue.org. If you go to that website, you can sign up for that webinar. And it's going to be an overview of what the MRP does and will feature some speakers from FWC, SeaWorld Orlando, Zoo Tampa, and um, the Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute. So um, really great way to learn a bit more about the work that the partnership does. So what else is part of the research that we do at Blue Spring? We do assist with manatee rescue, release, and recovery. Um, sometimes we also assist with post-release monitoring. And a few reasons why manatees particularly in the Blue Spring area, are rescued are boat strikes. So here we have um, Auntie Leslie. She's also in our adoption program. 
uh, rescued for very severe watercraft injury in 2018, and she was released back at Blue Spring two years ago. Another example would be Una. She has been rescued for entanglement twice right now, so um, she's also now adoption program. And um, entanglement is another reason manatees oftentimes get rescued at Blue Spring. Another reason here we have Moira Rose again uh, coming back from her previous slide. She was rescued for pretty severe coat stress. Sometimes we do have emaciated manatees at Blue Spring. Um, this is not necessarily because they're not finding enough food. Um, sometimes they have internal issues going on, but this is one of the um, manatees that we had to rescue for emaciation at Blue Spring two years ago. And then last but not least, orphaned calves, um, like little Ting Ting here, um, who we had to rescue last December. It's about almost a year ago now, and she's currently in rehabilitation at the Georgia Aquarium, um, doing really, really well, has gained a lot of weight and is definitely on her road to recovery. Um, with orphan calves, we always keep a very, very close eye on them um, to make sure that they are indeed orphaned and that they're not, not getting adopted by another female, which sometimes happens. That would be the best case scenario. And we want to make sure we're not um, taking any, any calves out of that population that may not be in need of rescue. So this is really the last resort if they're not getting adopted by a female um, that they have to be brought in for rehabilitation, like um, was the case with um, the Ting Ting here. Blue Spring is also a very popular release spot for manatees. So um, especially with the ongoing unusual mortality event on the Atlantic coast, a lot of manatees that were rescued as very small calves or orphans on the Atlantic coast are now released at Blue Spring because that's better habitat for them. And it's a lot easier to monitor their progress um, in that area. So this year um, we have 13 manatees that are slated to go out um, to be released at Blue Spring. So it's going to be an extremely busy winter season for everyone, but we're excited to uh, to welcome them to Blue Spring and hope that um, they're going to do a lot better in that system than they would potentially be doing elsewhere. So I wanted to throw this slide in um, because manatee tagging and tracking has really been um, a hot topic. And a lot of people are not quite familiar with how the technology work, what it looks like. There's a lot of questions and misconceptions. So I figured I'll um, throw in a really brief overview. Um, so hopefully, even if you're aware of it, um, maybe you can help us spread the word on, on social media or wherever you are um, and help us to, uh, to, to inform the public a little bit more about how that works. So some manatees are outfitted with satellite tracking devices and they consist of a belt that goes around where the tail meets the body, a tether, and then the satellite tag, which is on the top. And that's the piece of the equipment that um, transmits the information and the location of the manatee via satellite to the researcher's computer so they can see where the manatee is and what it's doing. And the equipment contains a whole bunch of other things too, like a sonar, VHF, um, like I said, the satellite transmitter. So all of that is contained and gathers a lot of data on um, the manatee's whereabouts and behavior. It is designed to come off if the manatee gets caught on something, whether that's a branch or a dock or something. Um, so it has several weak links and it can break off if the manatee gets caught on something. So there's never um, the danger of the manatee getting entangled and potentially drown or injure itself because of the equipment. The satellite tag can submerge with the with the manatee. Uh, manatees have been seen, you know, mating, um, giving birth while they're wearing the equipment. So it's really not hindering them in their natural behavior. And it's really important for people to um, not touch the equipment, not interfere with the equipment, not cut it off, um, especially for these young orphan manatees that are released. Um, they're outfitted with these tracking devices for researchers to make sure that they adapt to being out in the wild. Um, once that equipment comes off, there is no way for the researchers to keep track and potentially intervene if the manatee is not behaving the way it should or it's not going to a warm water source. So it's really it's not a good thing for them to leave to uh, to lose that equipment. So we're hoping that the public is helping us with that. If you do see um, a tag manatee, you can report that to FWC to the hotline. Um, sometimes the equipment is malfunctioning or like you can see here in the picture on the bottom right hand side, 
that Manti has lost its um, tether and its tag, but it's still wearing the belt. So it's really important for researchers to know that if you've seen a manatee that just has a belt, um, that, um, that they can come out and actually reattach the tag to the manatee. And this program is overseen by the researchers from the Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute. And if we have tag manatees at Blue Spring, oftentimes Wayne and I help with monitoring them, um, letting them know if a manatee has lost its tag, which um, happens quite a lot. And like I said, this season, um, 13 tag manatees are slated to be released at Blue Spring, which is probably the most that we've ever had. So for those of you who have not heard about our webcams, I wanted to give a, a really quick shout out here on the webcams. We do have live webcams at Blue Spring and above and an underwater camera, and you can see um, me and my uh, co-researchers here um, installing the cameras. They are live at mantv.org. Um, and if you go there, um, the above water camera is already live right now. Well, right now it's dark outside, but tomorrow morning, if you go to mantv.org, you will be able to see that. And hopefully the underwater camera will be live um, within the next two weeks. So they are really great education and entertainment tool for the public, but they also <clears throat> assist us with our research at Blue Spring. And that's something that a lot of people are not really aware of, that they're a really good research tool for us. So what have we learned from these cameras? First of all, they have um, given us additional sightings for our photo ID research. So sometimes there's manatees that we do not see in the morning while we're out there, but then they go by on the webcam and we can collect those photos for the photo ID research. Oftentimes we don't actually get a photo of the manatee, you know, it may just be swimming by real quick or it's sitting um, in a murky area and then it goes by on the webcam and we can actually use those photos for the ID, uh, for the photo ID research. We can also monitor specific behaviors um, that are hard to observe or document in person. For example, if we have a sick or an injured manatee, those webcams are really helpful because the manatee may just go by and the camera is recording it. So we or other researchers don't actually have to get in the water with the manatee and try to get close and observe it um, if we have the webcam, which is sort of passively and non-obtrusively -obs observing the manatee for us. So some of our uh, prime examples, we had manatee swale here. As you can see in the picture, he was suffering from um, a pretty fresh uh, boat strike. And every morning when we were doing our counts, he was uh, pretty lethargic at the spring head, wasn't really moving a whole lot. So there was definitely um, discussion about intervention and rescuing him. But then in the afternoon, um, our above water webcam would document him uh, chasing around females. So um, definitely a good indication that he was probably better um, than we thought he was. And he fully recovered and is still at Blue Spring and doing really well. Another one here that we uh, sort of nicknamed the side swimmer, he was um, injured by a boat strike and um, there were several attempts to capture this individual. It was very difficult because he would come up for air to breathe and then would just swim off really quickly. Um, very difficult to observe and document that behavior in person and then pass it on to our fellow researchers. So instead, the above water camera was doing a really good job documenting his behavior, which then helped us to to get that onto FWC and have them evaluate how he was doing. Here we have Moira Rose coming in again. Um, like I said before, she was rescued from very severe cold stress and she came by the underwater webcam and actually rode over, which allowed us to see that she was also very um, heavily pregnant. So this was something that really then influenced and informed the decision to rescue her and also be extra careful during the rescue, uh, making sure that we wouldn't endanger the calf, unborn calf in any way. So um, again, something we would have never known if it wasn't for the webcams. And then last but not least, um, maybe some of you have heard, we had a manatee a couple of years ago at Blue Spring that was entrapped in a bicycle tire. Again, many, many, many attempts made to rescue this manatee that was not successful, but then he came back during the 2020, uh, 21 season and the first sighting of him was on our webcams and he was confirmed to be tire free. So a tire had come off and we saw that on our webcam. So last but not least to wrap it up, I want to really briefly touch on 
some of the manatee research that we do in the summer months. So I want to say 90% of our research is during the winter, um, during manatee season, and we do have federal research permits to do that in the winter season. Now we also started doing some summer research. And we started this in 2016, and manatee sightings in the summertime have really increased since then. So when I started in 2014, we had you know a couple of manatees that came in during the summer, um, mostly females that were pregnant or um, curious juveniles. And now um, we're just seeing manatees come in almost every single day. So um, we have gathered the data for that from our above water webcam and also from um, in-person sightings. Possible reasons why there are more manatees coming in during the summer is because it's still a protected area. Although people can swim and scuba dive and paddle in the summer, um, it's still more protected than the open water in the St. John's River. So some manatees may be coming in to, to kind of seek refuge in there. Um, it's also considered a calving ground. So we do have some pregnant females that come in during the, uh, the summer months and birth their calves. Um, since we have seen an increase in the population in general, we also think that has something to do that with, with that that we're seeing more in the summertime. And then some manatees are just simply curious. Um, you know, they're especially the juveniles. Um, if they're people swimming or scuba diving in the spring, they just really like to come in and check that out. And due to having so many sightings during the summer months, we started in collaboration with other agencies, a uh, manatee observer volunteer program at Blue Springs. So as you can see here, we have um, observer volunteers on a kayak and on the boardwalk, and they are uh, monitoring manatees, trying to prevent harassment, educate visitors about manatees. So um, if you're interested in that program, I put the URL in here, savethemanagerorg slash volunteer. Um, that is something we will provide training in the spring, and then the volunteers help us out during the summer months. So some of the examples um, from our summer research that were really outstanding to me. Um, this is a manatee named Three Notch. Um, he just happened to surface right in front of the webcam in August of 2018, and neither Wayne nor I um, could match him. So we were told by the folks from the SCAR ID program from the general database that he was a known Blue Spring manatee that had not been seen at Blue Spring in 23 years. Um, he had a sighting history in Miami and um, just happened to come back to Blue Spring that, that summer. And then unfortunately he, he, um, he passed away in December of that same year back down in Miami. Now, if it hadn't been for the, for the camera, we would have never known that he had come back to Blue Spring um, one more time. So very interesting sighting. Um, another example here is uh, Manatee Amber. That's her with a calf over there in the middle. She um, used to come in and bring in her calves um, during the summer months. It was almost like clockwork. Every morning at 11 a.m. she would come in with her calf. And I said earlier that the calves at Blue Spring are growing um, quicker and larger than um, in other areas. So one of the reasons why we know this is because we can document that on the webcam. So if we see them coming in with a newborn, um, for example, in April or May, and then they keep coming in over the weeks and months, uh, we can really document um, how quickly that calf is growing. And then last but not least, we do have some manatees like um, Phyllis here. She's one of our adoptees. Um, she is one of the ones who tends to give birth at Blue Spring during the summer months. She was she herself was born in 1985 and belongs to one of the long genealogies at Blue Spring, um, has had at least 16 calves. But the webcam is really helping us because when we see her coming in, you know, a, a couple of days in a row, we kind of get a feeling um, that she may be able that she may be getting ready to to have her calf. And that really helps us making decisions and informing the park and making sure we can protect her and the newborn calf as much as possible. So um, seeing those females coming in, you know, for a couple of days in a row and like exhibiting certain behaviors is really helping us to um, to monitor that situation and to to uh, prepare for that. So all very interesting examples. So with that, I will um, sort of wrap up my uh, my formal presentation here, 
and I'd be happy to take any questions. I also put my email address on there. If somebody has a question that they don't want to ask or they want some follow up information, um, you can, uh, you know, contact me via email. And I'm again, I'm really honored to be working with Wayne Hartley. That's him here in the picture with me and my little uh, stuffed manatee. And um, we're hoping to start our accounts at Blue Spring um, at the end of this week or early next week. So hopefully stay tuned for our updates. So uh, really excited for my anti season to start at Blue Spring. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll see if people have any questions. So there's a couple questions. Um, I think the first question was from Chris, uh, and Chris is wondering um, when you say that you record the number of boat strikes, how do you get that information? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, basically, we we're not recording when they are being hit, but we're recording when they're coming in with a new strike. So, and that's pretty easy to see because those you know those are fresh boat strikes. Or if we've seen the manatee. Um, let's say November and then comes in in December and we see a new, you know, prop strike or skeg mark or something, we know that it's been hit. So um, we're looking at the scars and that's how we keep track of, um, of the hits throughout the season. So then we make a list of how many manatees got hit and sometimes they get hit more than once. So there's a difference between how many got hit and how many, how many strikes we see in a season. Um, so William asked if we partnered with other organizations like the MRP, et cetera. I think we answered that question with your slide before. Um, yes, Ellen would like to know, I think Ellen would like to know, and Deb's question sort of dovetails on that. Um, do manatees from Blue Spring ever appear in any of the other springs, particularly more out west? Um, and Deb would like to know, um, if there are other areas that are protected for manatees like Blue Spring. So maybe we could do those sort of together. Yes, absolutely. Great question. So we work very closely with some of the researchers that are monitoring some of the other springs along the St. John's River. So specifically um, Silver Spring, Silver Glen, Salt Spring and Wallaka. And a lot of the manatees that are coming that are wintering at Blue Spring can also be seen at those springs and vice versa. So we get a lot of manatees that come from Silver Glen to us and then go back there. Sometimes they spend part of the winter there and part of the winter here. Um, we will not see any manatees that are wintering um, like on the West Coast. Like if you're thinking, you know, Crystal River or Ichitakni or Tampa Bay or something, those manatees would not come to Blue Spring. I mean, mainly the manatees that come to Blue Spring will be manatees coming either way from the St. John's River or from the Atlantic Coast. So they'll either come you know, from north, from like Georgia, the Carolinas or Jacksonville coming down into the St. John's, or they may be coming from south, like from the Miami area coming into the St. John's, or they may just spend the whole summer in the St. John's River and tributaries. But we will not see any manatees from spring, like from Crystal River or something showing up at Blue Spring. There would just be no way for them to kind of get there. So um, in terms of protections, Blue Spring is really the only site that is completely protected for them. That's what makes it so special. Um, there are definitely plans to hopefully have additional sanctuaries for manatees at other springs, such as Silver Glen, because we've seen, well, I shouldn't say we, because our, our co-researchers who do that research um, see more manatees at those springs. And unfortunately, harassment um, at those springs is a really big issue for manatees um, and it's it's been increasing over the years. So um, unfortunately, there's no protections like there are at Blue Spring at any other springs right now in the area, but um, definitely something that's being looked into and hopefully implemented. <clears throat> um, so Deb S would like to know, um, has there any, has there been any impact at Blue Spring um, on the manatees and I think on the spring in general um, as a result of flooding from the hurricanes? Yes, a uh, great and interesting question and very timely. So right now the water levels at Blue Spring are extremely high. Um, I have personally never seen it that high. Um, the swim deck um, is currently still underwater. So we're not seeing any direct impact at Blue Spring right now, but we had some of our Blue Spring manatees of the known ones show up in other places. So one example that I can give is the Wakaiva River. 
uh, Wakaiva River, Little Wakaiva and Rock Spring. For those of you familiar with Central Florida, that's a river that connects to the St. Johns River. So manatees have access there. Um, usually the water levels are too low for them to really get far into those rivers. But right now, because of all the flooding, we actually have manatees that are hanging out in those rivers very, very far inland. So that's not a problem as long as the water levels are high. Um, once the water levels drop, the problem is going to be that those manatees may get stuck or entrapped. So we're really asking the public to keep an eye out. Um, you know, if, if you see manatees that are in very unusual places, um, please report them either way to us or to FWC to make sure that they're being, someone is keeping an eye on that because um, if they don't make their way out of there, they could get trapped. And now with winter approaching, that can be a real big problem for them because if they get trapped in areas where they cannot access warm water, um, they can potentially die. So it, it's really important to keep an eye on that. So um, long story short, Blue Spring is not impacted too much by the hurricanes, but some of our amenities are definitely venturing out and we don't really know where they are right now. Um. Sarah, uh, Sarah would like to know um, if there are efforts to replant seagrass in the area um, and how successful are those types of projects in general? Yeah, good question. So there's definitely been um, some efforts to replant grasses in the same, in the Lake George area, which is closer to Silver Glen. Um, so there have been some efforts there by Fish and Wildlife Service and Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, that has unfortunately not taken off as as much as it should have, um, but those are still in progress. Unfortunately, right now with the hurricanes, what we are seeing is higher water levels, uh, darker water, so it's really difficult for anything that was growing back to establish itself. So we've seen some regrowth of really small sprigs of grass in some of the lakes, but unfortunately that was before the hurricane, so now we have these really high water levels. Uh, we're thinking that most likely that growth is already gone again, but there's definitely, yes, there are definitely projects in place to um, try to replant some of those grasses, probably not as much as it is being done right now in the Indian River Lagoon, um, since that's the primary area of concern. But yes, there's definitely projects in place and we are partnering with organizations on that too. Um, Sarah Radley would like to know um, if there are any volunteer opportunities for those of us living in the Jacksonville area. Um, which I might take if that's okay. Um, so that's a great question. Um, there, we have a number of different volunteer opportunities um, for folks in Florida across the country, um, and they they kind of take take place across the state. One of the primary ones that we do um, is attend events and festivals. Um, the biggest ones that we do are at Blue Spring, actually, um, and in Crystal River in January. Um, we also go to Manatee Fest at the Manatee Lagoon in Riviera Beach. Um, that's in March, I think. Or no, I think it's in early February this year. Um, but we are always available to do different events. Um, we have volunteers help us to table and pass out information and talk with people about manatees. Um, and why we should protect them in their habitat. Um, so there, there do come up opportunities to do that um, everywhere, including in Jacksonville. Um, we're also kind of actively uh, recruiting right now for our virtual presenter volunteers. So uh, this is something that we started um, during the pandemic that was really successful in setting up virtual presentations to speak with classrooms and um, with organizations, any individuals who want to learn about manatees. And we have a great team of volunteers who um, are trained and then give those presentations. Um, so that's another opportunity uh, that is available. So really, um, we're also thinking about partnering more with those organizations on the East Coast who are doing the seagrass planting. Um, if you're looking to do more hands-on work like that or with cleanups. So you can learn more about that um, on our website, uh, savethemanatee.org slash volunteer, where you can read about what the different opportunities are and sign up um, if any of them look good to you. So, that's the volunteer stuff. 
Um, I saw Rhonda, there was a follow up. Oh. Sorry, there was yes. a follow up comment from Chris earlier about how we uh, keep yes. track of the boat strikes. So yes, you're you're totally correct um, that there's a lot of strikes that are caused by the hulls or um, the the skeg as well. Um, you know, any of those that are causing severe internal injuries or deaths, we do keep track. Obviously, we keep track of those deaths as well and any sick and injured manatee. So if we have a manatee that's coming in presenting, you know, floating high on the surface or sinking to the bottom, which could be a result of um, a collision with, you know, a, a forced collision with the boat hull. Um, most likely those are manatees that need to be rescued or unfortunately that, um, you know, pass away. And we do keep track of all of those as well. Um, let's see. Um, Rhonda is wondering, um, has there been any impact on forage in the springs with the higher nutrient content and resultant cloudiness? And is there any monitoring in the springs and spring sheds for other anthropogenic contaminants? Yeah, so I can uh, speak a little bit to that. So um, historically, there has been some vegetation in Blue Spring a really, really long time ago. But um, in the last you know, decade or so, there really hasn't been vegetation growing inside the spring. Um, there was some vegetation in um, Silver Glen Spring, for example, that has also disappeared. So the question is still kind of like why that is. And we definitely think that the higher nutrient content um, in the water is, you know, part of that. Um, it would probably a better, be a better question to ask the Florida Springs Institute because they're doing more monitoring of the springs and the spring sheds. I can definitely tell you that there is monitoring going on, but since we're not um, directly involved in that. I can't really, I don't really have the answer for that, but we do think that any anthropogenic contaminants, whether that's nutrients or runoff from lawns, agriculture, any of these kind of things, um, herbicides are contributing to, you know, making the water more cloudy and then the vegetation cannot grow. So I, it's a lot of different causes that are coming together there. Um, I think Julie and her son have a very important question, I think. Um, he's wondering, um, Cora, which manatee is your favorite to observe and why? You know, that's a really, that's a really tough question. And people always ask me which one's my favorite. Um, if it comes to the adoptees, I almost have to say Annie, just because she, um, she has such a cool story. She was rescued as a tiny orphan and released at Blue Spring when she was grown. And now she's had five calves of her own. And um, one of her calves, I was the first person to actually see that calf when it was born in 2014. So I think that's why she's really special to me. Um, in terms of observing uh, manatees, though, I mean, the thing is they all have different personalities. And they're almost like a family. You know, you come back, you're like, oh, that's so-and-so. And, you know, it's just... I think from day to day, like it's just always something different and they all have their personalities. So it's really hard to just pick one single one. Um, I always go to any, but they definitely, they're all special in their own ways. And especially those that have, you know, suffered really severe injuries um, and have recovered or the ones that we helped rescue. And now we see that they're thriving. Um, that's a really, that's a really awesome thing. And I love observing that too. So that would be the answer. <laughs> Um, let's see, Chris says, isn't it President Annie? Pretty sure I voted for her in an SMC election a year or so ago. <laughs> yes, we did have our SMC humanity elections. I want to say, was it last year or the year before? I don't remember, but yes, I can remember that. I do remember that we had it and Annie probably won. She is, she is pretty popular. I have to say that. Um, Stephanie has a really good question, which is how do swim with the manatee outings affect manatees? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, so although it doesn't pertain directly to Blue Spring, I can definitely speak to that. So swimming with manatees is really it's only allowed in the Crystal River area, the Citrus County area where, um, you know, swim with manatee tours are offered. So it's really a catch 22 because if it's done responsibly and in the right way, it can really be a life changing experience for people. I mean, seeing such a majestic animal up close has really turned people into advocates and, you know, making them care about these animals. Unfortunately, um, what happens a lot is that people either way go on tours or go swimming by themselves and they're really not aware um, about proper manatee behavior. I mean, um, they harass manatees accidentally without even really thinking about it. They don't realize that manatees are coming to these warm water sites to stay warm, that this is survival for them. They're not there to be petted and be looked at by people in the water and be chased. Um, so it's really... Um, if you observe them, you know, quietly and from a distance, um, 
that's not the big problem. The problem is when there's just hordes of people, um, you know, pretending that this is a petting zoo. And then if the manatees have to move around and potentially leave an area because they feel annoyed, and either way they move into colder water or they move into the way of boat traffic, um, they're just expending a lot more energy than they should. And that's really not a good thing for manatees and can be detrimental in the long run. Um, they're trying to, if it's really cold and they're trying to rest in that warm water and they're being chased out by people, um, that can be um, that can be really harmful for them in the long run. Um, let's see. Um, Valerie says um, we haven't seen many manatees on the explore.org cam in the last week or so. Is there a reason for this? Um, I think Sarah said she saw one, but <laughs> yeah. So um, we do have um, so we do have the webcams over at Blue Spring, and we also have cameras at Homosassa Spring State Park. So the Homosassa cameras are live year round, and during the summer months, they're showing. Um, the permanent resident manatees and the rehab manatees and then during the winter months they're showing the wild manatees so if you've been watching the homosassa cameras the reason why you haven't seen man manatees in the last week is because the permanent residents and the rehabs were actually moved to a different area of the park due to the hurricanes and today they opened the the gates for the wild manatees so now the uh, the wild manatees can come into the park so as soon as it gets gonna get cold we're hoping you know um, end of this week, you should be able to see manatees on that camera again. Um, for Blue Spring, we just went live with the cameras maybe about a week ago or two. Um, so again, with the warm weather, um, it just hasn't been cold. That's why there haven't been any manatees on the Blue Spring cameras. But apparently the park saw a couple of the day. I saw a few on the webcam, just, you know, one going by. So keep an eye out. Um, keep an eye on the weather. As soon as it's going to get cold, you will see manatees on the webcam, I can promise you that. <laughs> um, Cora, would you want to share anything that we know currently? I know this is sort of a hot button topic about the supplemental feeding program um, that's run sure. by the FWC in, around the IRL. Sure, absolutely. So at this point, we really don't have a lot of information. Um, like Megan said, this is a program that is being run by FWC uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission and Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's no answer right now if they're going to do the supplemental feeding again this year. Um, we all need to you know, keep in mind that this is just a band-aid on a much bigger problem. Um, our main thing is that we're working on improving water quality and replanting of grasses. But we, you know, the supplemental feeding is definitely helping some of the manatees getting through the winter. So um, in terms of that, I can't really say if it's going to happen again this year or not. Um, we were, you know, it was a good thing that it happened last year. It probably got some animals through the winter, although it's really not something that's going to save a whole bunch of manatees because it's um, it's a small scale effort. And as long as we have those ongo ongoing problems and loss of seagrass, um, supplemental feeding is still not going to really you know help fix the problem but it could help some of these animals get through the winter so um yes. i think we have one more in the chat from aaron um who is wondering um he says i, I know you've had to rescue manatees that have gone too far north um have we ever had to rescue manatees that have gone too far south during the winter or got into water that was too warm yeah, that's a really interesting question. I have asked myself that question before. Can the water ever get too warm for manatees? And I think the answer is no. Um, we definitely didn't have to rescue any manatees that went too far south. We've actually had some manatees um, that went from Florida to Cuba and from Florida to Mexico. So, um, you know, some very adventurous guys out there that went all the way over there. Um, in terms of it getting too warm, I think that's only really an issue if a manatee beaches itself, whether that's um, in the summertime um, during mating activity or just for some other reason that the manatee beaches itself, it can overheat. So, you know, they can definitely um, have issues with that, but I don't think that the water can ever get too warm where the manatee has to be rescued because it's too warm. I have never heard of that. I know that there's manatees, um, you know, in Mexico and Belize and South America and West Africa, and they are probably in the waters that are much warmer than we have it here in Florida, and there's never been an issue. So I don't think there's really an upper temperature limit, but there definitely is a um, a low temperature limit where they, you know, suffer from cold stress if it gets too cold for them. But it's a good question. I don't know if anyone really has the answer for that. 
Um, let's see. Um, Stephanie would like to know, are there any restrictions on the use of pesticides on lawns close to the water? Um, and is there an educational program that's being shared with homeowners? Yeah, good question. So um, I do know that some counties have um, certain bans for fertilizers, so that doesn't necessarily just include pesticides, but I know that Volusia County and Brevard County and certain um, certain areas do have um, fertilizer bans or recommendations for the summertime. Now, I'm not entirely sure about educational programs with homeowners. You may want to check. We have a website. Um, I can type it in the chat or Megan can. It's savethemanager.org slash algae, um, where we have compiled a lot of information in regard to the ongoing algae blooms. And there's some um, information on there as well with links to external sites um, on, on more of the uh, on the topic of herbicides and pesticides and educational programs. So um, unfortunately, I don't know exactly um, about that, but also feel free to shoot me or Megan an email because I think our um, senior conservation associate, Kim, um, she is the expert in water quality and all those, those kind of regulations. So I'm sure that she would be the one to be able to answer that question for you for sure. So if you want to send us a follow up email, I can definitely pass that along or provide me with your email address and I'll pass it on to Kim. Unless Megan, if you have any uh, input, please uh, <laughs> let me know. No, like, I think that I think that covers it. Um, let's see. How many, do we know how many more manatees can be taken into, can be rescued and taken for rehabilitation given the existing capacity? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good and a scary question. Um, so right now, the rehab, a lot of the rehab facilities, and there's a lot of them, um, they already have a lot of manatees. And luckily, a lot of them are slated to be released this winter. So, you know, as soon as they're ready, um, if when they have reached the right size and the right weight, um, they are going to be re released back out into the natural habitat, making space for those critical care cases. Um, also really encouraging is that we have a lot of new facilities that have jumped on board very recently. Um, an example would be the Georgia Aquarium, um, Aquarium Encounters down in the Florida Keys. Um, Columbus Zoo has taken a, a significant amount of manatees, way more than they ever have before. So um, luckily we've spread, the manatees have been kind of spread out into those facilities. So in terms of giving you a real number of how many more manatees can be taken into rehab, um, I don't know. I think right now we are looking at a situation where we do have some room in the facilities, but not a lot. And it also really depends on the cases. Um, you know, it's very different Different if you have to make room for like a mom-calf pair or if you have an orphan calf that needs 24-7 care and bottle feeding or if you have something that comes in for like a starvation case. Um, so um, luckily there's definitely some capacity as we're going into the winter. I We all wish there was more, but they're also all trying to get as many manatees released right now as they can to make room for those critical care cases or moving critical cases that are not critical anymore, moving them into those spaces where they uh, they can stay for a couple more weeks or months just to gain weight until they can be released to make room in the critical care facilities to bring in more new cases. Um, and this might be the last question. So Tracy, um, have you have you heard of any manatee injuries or deaths in Southwest Florida as a result of Hurricane Ian? So I have personally not heard about any um, deaths of manatees, but I have heard about quite a few manatees that were entrapped um, that had to be relocated. So like I said before, what oftentimes happens is that manatees explore new, new areas. So when the water levels rise, they get themselves into somewhere and then the water levels drop and they suddenly can't get back out. Um, I mean, we've had manatees in golf course ponds and in other areas where they, you know, got over something and then the water levels dropped and then they were stuck in there. So I know that FWC had res has responded to quite a few calls, um, especially in the Southwest Florida area where they had to relocate manatees. Um, I haven't heard of any deaths, but then again, um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's also very difficult to tell because the area is just so impacted that people are just slowly starting you know, to move back into their houses or what's left there. So um, there's also not been that many people that could actually see and report those manatees like there usually would be. So I think, um, you know, 
the next couple of weeks and months will probably show more of that. But but that's what we know right now. And again, we're relying on the public to let FWC know of any reports, any any sick and injured manatees, anything that's entrapped to let us know so they can go out there and try to relocate them. All right. And any final question? We'll see if any final questions uh, come in, but um, I think we may be wrapping up. So thank you, Cora, um, sure. for that great presentation. Um, so this has been recorded. Um, we will be kind of setting that up. It will be accessible on our Save the Manatee Club website um, very soon if you want to watch it again or if you want to refer others to watch it. Um, we also are kind of doing these webinars pretty regularly. We want to sort of make them available and talk to people about manatees. So if you have an idea for a webinar that you'd like to hear us do um, or any other questions or things that you're interested in, um, please send us an email at education at save the manatee.org. I'll put that in the chat um, or you can um, send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, we'll see it there. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. I think there was one last question that Kathleen had. Um, Chris already kind of addressed it, so I can just uh, do that real brief. Why are there uh, permanent resident manatees at Homosassa um, Spring State Park? So those are manatees that were either way um, born in the human setting and could not be released. That was before um, all the different regulations came into place or manatees that have, are so severely injured that they cannot survive out in the wild. So the manatees that they have right now are considered permanent residents um, because they're just not able to live out in the wild um, and you know care for themselves. So um, that's a determination that's being made by the Fish and Wildlife Service. They determine when a manatee um, is not able to go back out into the wild. Very, very few cases where that's a problem, but um, three of the, the girls <laughs> at Homosassa, they are constant, or actually two of them, the third one, we're not entirely sure yet, but um, they just couldn't survive out in the wild. So that's why they're considered permanent residents. So they're doing a good job educating visitors about the plight of the wild manatees, at least. So. I think that's it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for attending and uh, yeah, thanks Megan for um, for hosting this and uh, hope everyone has a good night. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.